I'm black. Some people will say brown, others will say chocolate. Then some others will use some nasty words. I'm a woman. Some people will say little girl, others will say second class citizen. I am an African. Some people will say corrupt, most people will say poor. What a way to make everyone uncomfortable. But you see, I share these aspects of myself because before I was conceived, the world decided how I would be treated and what the trajectory of my life should be. The world has subconsciously influenced so many of you here today in how you perceive me. And I make you uncomfortable for a reason. I make you uncomfortable to show you that it is possible for young people to stand up and step up in their society to lead. I am 23, I'm black, I'm a woman, and I'm an African. And who would have ever imagined that I'd be in Frankfurt today talking about youth empowerment? See, youth empowerment is not a choice for us. And I say it's not a choice for us because every section of the world is falling apart. We see genocide, gender-based violence, slavery, poverty, refugee camps, attacks by extremists, and despicable leadership. And that's just naming a few. And when I think of all these things happening in the world, I always remember the words of Professor Pak Eng from the University of Cape Town. She once told me, we are the ones we have been waiting for. And I say youth empowerment is not a choice because we are the ones we have been waiting for. We are the ones who have to step up in our societies and lead. Throughout my life, there have been various experiences that have challenged me to stop waiting for other people to come with solutions and to make solutions myself. And I'm sure that in your own life, you've had experiences that have challenged you as well. But were you still waiting for other people? Or did you step up and lead? I'm going to share three stories with you that encouraged me, that forced me to stop waiting for others. Firstly, when I was 10 years old, my dad and I went to the shopping mall to run some errands. And it was a casual Sunday. He parked his car, and two seconds afterwards, a white woman jumped out of her car and called my dad a kaffir. Now, a kaffir in a South African context is a very racist word to use towards a black person. And she called him a kaffir all because she felt that she was entitled to a parking spot, even though he got there first. So today, I don't wait. We cannot wait. Today, we see videos of police brutality in the States on black bodies. Today, like many black people in the world, I can't wait because all I want is to be recognized as a human in a world that chooses to see me as an animal. When I was 12 years old, I was innocently parading around the grocery store in a dress my mom got for me. And a man gave me a look that I will never forget. It was a look that sexualized me, and at age 12, I recognized that look. So today, I don't wait. We cannot wait. We see statistics of gender-based violence every single day. We've got high femicide rates in Mexico, El Salvador, South Africa, India, Hong Kong, and so many other countries. When I was 14, impersonating a British or American accent was one of my favorite things to do. It sounds very weird, I know. And why? And it's because society showed me through the media that being white and American or white and British was the most amazing positionality to have. And in contrast, being African and black was something to be ashamed of. So today, I don't wait. I can't wait. And in the two months that I've been pursuing my masters in London, I have met incredible young Africans. And when I share with them my passions for Africa's development, they always say to me, yeah, well, Africa has many problems. I don't have time for that. And so I've stopped waiting. I can't wait anymore. 
So the question then becomes, what does it mean to stop waiting? What do you do when you stop waiting? What actions do you take? And throughout my life, again, I've tried so many different things, which I'm very excited to share with you. I first went on to Twitter. And Twitter is a fantastic platform because you get to write these short comments, you get to hold leaders accountable, you get direct access to high-profile individuals to challenge them on things. My friends like to say, yeah, you get to slide into people's DMs, you get to at people, which is fantastic. But how effective is Twitter? How effective is it as a platform for social change? And I understand that in some cases, campaigns can be super effective, and we've seen the power of hashtags. And I get that if Twitter is used well, and not to spread alternative facts, something we can teach our current leaders about, if Twitter is used well, then it can have a great impact. But to what extent? Then I went on to Facebook, and Facebook is awesome because anyone who knows me knows that I love to write long paragraphs about things that I'm passionate about. So Facebook allowed me to write thought-provoking statuses to challenge my friends and my followers. And again, I had to ask myself, is this effective? Then we got Facebook videos where we could share about injustices around the world and change the narrative. And that's cool, but I asked myself again, so you spend two minutes watching a video, 30 seconds writing a short summation of the video, and then you share it, but is that impact? How far does sharing an ATTN video go? How many World Economic Forum videos do you have to share on your Facebook to properly effect tangible change? Then I said, okay, cool. In addition to my keyboard warrior behavior, which is a term I really love, how can, we, how can I make tangible change? So I decided I've got it, I've got it. I'm gonna work really, really hard in university so that one day I can be financially stable enough to create some cool organization that's gonna change the world. One day. And I started asking myself again, how can I wait for one day in a world that is telling me it needs me now? Is my degree shaping me to be a change maker? Or is my degree shaping me so that I can be a great employee for the top consulting firms? And I ask myself this every day. As you can see, I'm a very inquisitive person, so my family gets very annoyed. But these questions were super important. And like so many of you here today, I can relate. I worked at Deloitte and had a fantastic time there. And the whole time I was working there, I asked myself, how do I make tangible change? How do I do this in addition to everything else I'm doing at work? And these are pertinent questions. I then went on to say, cool, as a young person, the world is constantly telling me that you must wait until you've got seven years of work experience before you can be a change maker. The world tells us that, no, unless you're mature, you can't start a business. You need a seven-page CV before you make tangible change. How do we navigate ageist complexities that seem to discourage young people? Now, the one solution I do have for everyone in this room is pretty simple. And it's not a solution that will be liked by many politicians around the world, but it's one that I'll gladly share with you. We ignore these discouraging voices and we make change anyway. Ignore the voices that tell you that you can't do things just because you're a young person and make the change anyway. We are the ones we have been waiting for. Our world needs us now. Our world does not need us to follow this progression and then at some stage decide that we're gonna have impact. I decided from a very young age that I was not gonna wait until I was 40 to do something cool, to do something meaningful, to change people's lives. The one area that I was particularly interested in changing was of the perception of Africa to Africans. Now, what does that mean, right? So for many of you here, your perception of Africa is so different to mine. We're fed that Africa's poor, Africa's corrupt, Africa's weak, and I smile when I say this, not because I agree, but because I find it hilarious because my vision of Africa is so different. I believe in an empowered Africa, I believe in an Africa that's got potential for growth. And I believe that it was possible and necessary for us as young people to step up and change that. 
So, I had no experience. I had fears, I had so much anxiety, oh, so much anxiety, and so many doubts. But I approached young people in my community and partnered with them. And in particular, one of the most incredible young people, her name is Rianne Olivier. Now, Rianne and I together founded Africa Matters. Africa Matters is a youth-led organization that is dedicated to creating spaces for young Africans to be empowered. We want young Africans to change the narrative by reshaping the way we look at Africa, by leading in our societies now, and that means that we need to become active citizens. We started this in university just two years ago. And through our workshops on African feminisms, summits on African leadership, school talks on youth empowerment, and great online media presence, in just over two years, we've managed to impact 15,000 African and diaspora. And I think that's something. And that shows you the power of young people who get together to make change. A few weeks ago, I sat in a lecture, a development lecture, a subject I love. And the professor said to the class, you know, guys, from my research, there'll be 30 countries in the world that will always be poor. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then he, he was asked to give examples. And he said, oh, you know, Sierra Leone and those other ones. Okay. So he alluded to the fact that so many countries in Africa would continue to be poor indefinitely. And I felt three emotions then. I felt anger. I felt disappointment and discouraged. I was angry at the colonial history that has stripped Africa bare and left us economically backwards. I was disappointed at the African leaders who have put forward their own agendas rather than the people that voted for them. And I was discouraged because I thought to myself, if this is what statistics say, then what is Africa Matters even doing? Can we really make an impact? Are we biting off more than we can chew? And so, I remembered these words. We are the ones we've been waiting for. And this sounds very non-German, I know, because he gave me statistics. But I said to him, I reject your research. I adamantly reject your research. And I reject that research because I strongly believe in the power of young people around the world to change our societies. Africa has over 220 million young people between the ages of 15 to 24. Now that can either be a burden or an opportunity. And I believe that it is more of an opportunity. Young people today have access to innovative resources that enable us to make tangible change. Globalization has completely shaped the way we interact with each other. Globalization allows us to share ideas, knowledge and solutions. I am studying in the UK because of globalization, because my aim is to go back home and be like, damn, let's, e let's effect this amazing change. Globalization is the reason I'm here today. Youth, Youth for Advocates gives us these stats. They say that 238 million youth live below the poverty line. And of all the unemployed people in the world, youth constitute 41%. UNESCO goes on to tell us that in 2015, there were 1.2 billion youth. This means that one in every six people on earth was a young person. Now, I'd like to believe that all of us in this room have access to resources and opportunities that millions of young people around the world don't have. And I'm including myself when I say all of us in this room have these opportunities. So what are we waiting for? Why are we content being keyboard warriors? Why have we convinced ourselves that we can't do anything in addition to studying? And I know studying is hard, but we've got so many hours. We can do so much. Our world needs us to step up. Society needs us now more than ever. World leaders are getting younger and younger. And if we are the ones we've been waiting for, then we need to put that into action. We all come from different communities, 
that needs some form of fixing. Whether it's creating an app that will encourage communities to go green, or creating platforms for youth engagement in politics, or going into schools and being a role model for young people, because that's the one thing the world lacks. It's young role models who can cultivate that change in other young people. There's something that we can all do in our societies. And the misperception is that to effect tangible change, you need to start big. But that doesn't have to be the case. Africa Matters started so small. We started as an online article sharing shindig, and suddenly we grew, and we grew and grew, and this year has been a year of such success, and we hope to grow from success to success. The key is that you just need to start. Team up with young people. Share your skills, share your passions, and then seek wisdom from older people, because their experiences can tell you what works, what doesn't work, can you try this? But you be the one who's going to effect that change. You be the one who's going to make an impact in your society. I stopped waiting a very long time ago. And if we are the ones we've been waiting for, then my final question to everyone in this audience today is, are you still waiting? Thank you. Thank you.